1997, world-famous fashion designer Gianni Versace was gunned down in the street. It was the culmination of a three-month, two-and-a-half-thousand-mile rampage. I quickly realized that this was much, much bigger than anything we had ever dealt with. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. He was like right there, boom. It was horrifying. Even 16 years doesn't change things. And with it, the question, why had Andrew Cunanan, a good-looking and popular young man, embarked on this devastating killing spree? To think that Andrew killed Gianni Versace was just about the most preposterous thing that anybody could ever tell you. In 1997, Miami, Florida, a city enjoying a renaissance after a period of decline, the neighborhood of South Beach leading the way. A new reputation as a flamboyant and glitzy playground for the clubbers, fashionistas, and playboys of any sexual orientation was developing. Innocence and South Beach do not go hand in hand. I mean, it was a place where people hooked up. And it was a wild scene. 1997, Miami Beach was a very up and coming place. South Beach had been discovered in the early 90s and uh, people were starting to flock to Miami Beach. It was like the place to be. People were paying big money for rooms that were once uh, a dollar a night. There were hundreds of dollars a night. So it, it was a big change in this area. It became the, the, the mecca for, for modeling. It became the mecca for um, the, the, the designers coming down from, from New York, from Europe. And this was where, you know, this was happening. It was right here. Miami was made desirable by one man in particular, Gianni Versace. Versace was a household name in the fashion industry. He dressed everyone from the opera stars to the film stars to royalty. He was, without doubt, the most famous fashion designer in the world. Gianni Versace was famous for his fashion design, but here in Miami Beach, he was famous just for being Versace. I mean, where he went, people took notice. He was part of the glamour and glitz that was becoming South Beach. Gianni was a, a regular. Um, uh, whenever he was in town, he was here about every day to get his newspapers um, and, and a cup of coffee. Uh, the Versace mansion is about four blocks away, about a three, three minute walk. Everybody that, you know, came, they always wanted to see the house and the, the house that Versace built. One such onlooker was 27-year-old Andrew Cunanan. <laughs> 8 40 a.m., July the 15th, 1997. South Beach was waking to another perfect morning. Within half an hour, one of the world's most brutal spree killers would claim his highest profile victim yet. The day is a day you never forget. It's early morning, Miami Beach. There are joggers about. A few news vendors have set up stalls. Versace uh, had come in for his newspapers, and I said, good day, and he said, good day, and he left and went home. 8.55 a.m. Cunanan had spotted his prey. He's already decided what he's going to do. He's got the gun in his pocket. He's not drunk. He's not high on drugs. He's just high on what he's about to do. Before Versace reached the safety of his home, the killer made his move. Versace was allowing himself into his own gated quarters. He snuck up behind him and shot him at point blank range. Shot. 
Well, it was something like something out of the movies, you know? He was just, uh, he was gunned down right on his steps. There was uh, blood everywhere. Mr. Versace was laying there on the steps. Uh, there was magazines that he was holding in his hand on the floor. Uh, we had bullet casings. In the chaotic aftermath, Cunanan escaped. Once uh, Mr. Versace was shot, the killer fled northbound on Ocean Drive. He came running right behind me. He went right across the street into the parking lot. A policeman on a bicycle came right by. I hadn't even moved from where I was standing. And um, he asked if I had seen you know, Mr. Versace. I said, yeah, he just left. And I said, why? And he says, something terrible happened. It didn't take long for the celebrity murder in Miami to become breaking news. This whole area was filled with the satellite TV dishes, uh, dozens of them. I've never seen anything like it before or, or since. And it soon began to emerge that Versace was victim number five of a killing spree that had begun three months earlier at the opposite end of the country. I quickly realized that this was much, much bigger than anything we had ever dealt with in Miami Beach. Despite the global spotlight, days after the Versace murder, Andrew Cunanan was nowhere to be found. How did an infamous rampage killer end up in Miami on that hot summer day? And how did a boy from San Diego suburb grow into America's most wanted man? Miami, Florida, and the brutal slaying of fashion designer Gianni Versace has rocked America. He is the latest victim of a three-month, five-state bloody rampage. What had driven Andrew Cunanan to commit his killing spree? And as the Miami police tracked him in the aftermath of the Versace murder, would they catch him before he killed again? 9.41 p.m., August the 31st, 1969. National City, California. Andrew Cunanan was born the youngest of four. Indulged by his parents, Cunanan was brought up in modest surroundings to a Filipino father and devoutly religious mother in a crime-ridden suburb of San Diego County. They were not of, of terrific means by any, any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Pete Cunanan, his father, was a, was a stockbroker. His mother, uh, Mary Ann Cunanan, she was a bit of a doting mother. It was only when his mother, Mary Ann, inherited some money from her father that the family were able to afford to move slightly upmarket to an area that wasn't as dangerous, wasn't as dirty. From the start, his father, in particular, encouraged the young Andrew to be status conscious and instilled in him a sense of self-confidence that would last a lifetime. Andrew Cunanan's first day at high school was not in rough National City, but in one of California's wealthiest seaside communities. Like many immigrant parents, they wanted their son to have a better life than they had had in the home country and they were willing to sacrifice and be sort of submissive and subservient to Andrew so that he could have the lifestyle that they, they would wish for their progeny. The esteemed Bishops was one of the country's top college prep schools and a breeding ground for future movers and shakers. I remember Andrew uh, at Bishops. I remember hearing his laugh and we immediately hit it off. He was, uh, he was really kind of a card. He was determined that his classmates who came from rich families wouldn't know how poor his own family was. Cunanan's school fees were in fact stretching his parents' finances to the limit. And that meant that he created more and more uh, stories about himself and tried to give the impression that he came from the sort of high, upper-class family that, of course, he didn't come from. Andrew lived in a bit of a fantasy world. For example, he pretended like 
Uh, he was Sebastian from Brideshead Revisited. Uh, he'd carry a teddy bear around campus. This need to conceal and to act, basically, and be on stage uh, all the time continued through the end of our friendship at Bishop's. Cunanan's charisma and good looks were powerful, and he wasn't afraid to use either. He had the ability to charm, and he became quite a manipulative young man. The warning signs of the man Andrew Cunanan was to become were already there. His psychopathic tendencies started at that early age because he became adept at being a shallow face, a different persona for what the situation required. Andrew had a, a gay veneer. Um, that was part of his uh, um, persona. Uh, so the uh, effeminate uh, or um, androgynous even, perhaps, uh, look that he had was all designed to, to convey the impression, I think, that he was gay. If you think about um, Andrew taken to his logical conclusion, Liberace comes to mind, Elton John comes to mind. He was basically the center of the universe on campus. Uh, he was a giant explosion of personality. But soon, the stage at Bishop's wasn't enough for Andrew Cunanan. After graduation, Cunanan gravitated towards the predominantly homosexual neighborhood of Hillcrest in San Diego. The Hillcrest area is very lively. It's a great place to be uh, gay, and at the time was a sensational um, opportunity for anybody uh, coming from anywhere else in the country to uh, be out and proud. Hungry for the high life and worshiping fame and celebrity, he began dating wealthy older men who provided for him. Andrew loved that freedom and uh, reveled in in the opportunity to uh, parade young men, old men, uh, all sorts of uh, companions. Andrew Cunanan had years of successfully negotiating his way through Californian high society, thanks to the patronage of his sugar daddies and well-meaning friends. Andrew Cunanan actually used um, being gay as a way to climb a social ladder through his ability to seduce or be seduced by older men in powerful jobs. He seemed to have quite a bit of money. Oftentimes would pull a nice fat wad of cash out, uh, buy drinks for everybody at the bar. Uh, he didn't hold a job to the best of our knowledge. He had a nice car that he would drive around. He'd wore very nice clothes, always put together well. For almost 10 years, he had enjoyed being a fixture in the San Diego gay community, a charmer who talked big and parted hard. Andrew was a showman. He had a story for everything. He had a hellacious little laugh. It's somewhere along the lines of a, of a belt of a hyena, perhaps getting poked in the rear with a pin. We'll give it a ha, 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 ha,
closely following trail to the North Star State was another of Cunanan's ex-lovers, David Madsen, the one he called the love of his life. Dave was an architect. He had a nice demeanor. It was all American. Uh, Kellogg's cornflakes box grin. Uh, quite an easy going good guy. Cunanan felt abandoned. He saw the friendship between Trail and Madsen as the ultimate betrayal. The happier they seemed, the angrier Cunanan became. He wanted a confrontation. Cunanan prepared to leave San Diego by holding a final get-together with his friends, an event that has since been dubbed the Last Supper. Andrew had a very unique personality. Uh, he was quite a grandstander. He was uh, one to uh, leap up from the table if anybody should join the table, introduce him with first and last names. He was uh, a gregarious individual. He would always insist on being placed in the front room, which looked out onto the street, so that he could see and be seen. The usual life and soul of the party was uncharacteristically subdued. It was not a typical uh, uh, showman's uh, dinner table. He didn't leap up, he didn't chase people around. He was uh, soft-spoken, thoughtful, contemplative, perhaps. Uh, befitting of the occasion. Cunanan claimed he wanted a new start. Instead, it was the beginning of the end. April the 25th, 1997, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Cunanan arrives from San Diego for a weekend stay at Madsen's apartment. Madsen picked him up from the airport. Many people were concerned and warned Madsen that Cunanan didn't seem himself. He said that he just needed to sort himself out and needed a place to stay. Jennifer Weiberg was the caretaker of Harmony Lofts in Minneapolis, where David Madsen lived. I actually encountered David Madsen and his friend that he introduced me to, who was Andrew. Andrew was non-responsive. David seemed rather irritated that he was being so aloof. I saw this kind of puffy guy with an attitude that I can't see why, how or why anyone would ever have been impressed with him or wanting to hang out with him. Sometime on Sunday the 27th of April, something had finally pushed Cunanan to the point of no return. Bitter with betrayal and driven by jealousy, a vicious argument ensued between Jeffrey Trail, David Madsen, and Andrew Cunanan with fatal consequences. Cunanan found a claw hammer in that apartment and started bludgeoning Jeffrey Trail. Following this attack, Cunanan calmly rolls Jeffrey Trail's body up in a rug and pushes it unceremoniously behind a sofa as if no one would find it. Some spree killers who are killing in a state of frenzy uh, aren't interested in hiding the evidence. After two days holed up in the apartment and with no apparent plan of what to do next, Cunanan fled the gruesome scene with Madsen. Cunanan's spontaneous murder of Trail happened so quickly that Madsen was unable to comprehend what had happened or to even intervene. That's the kind of thing that psychopaths are able to do with their powers of persuasion. A few days later, Jennifer Weiberg received some worrying news. Tuesday I came home and there were two messages on my voicemail from co-workers of David Matson, And they were very concerned because he had not shown up for work and people were looking for him. Knocked on the door. David, David, are you in there? Are you in there? And no sounds. So I did have a master key and I opened the door. It was horrifying. She didn't know it at the time, but what she had discovered was the beginning of one of America's most famous spree killings. 
Jeffrey Trail had become Andrew Cunanan's first victim. May the 2nd, Rush City, Shisego County. I was on patrol in the morning and I got a call from our dispatchers. They told me to meet uh, two fishermen. They were scouting an area to put a tent so they could come up to fish the next weekend. And when they looked down by the lake, they saw what they thought was a body. This is the crime scene. The fisherman stopped right about here and just pointed down toward the lake where they said the body was. He was like right there, boom. So we didn't know who, the, who we had here until we put out a uh, teletype to uh, surrounding agencies that we had an unidentified deceased white male and Minneapolis police called us back shortly thereafter and said that they were looking for a person that matched that description by the name of Dave Madsen. David Madsen was now victim number two. Police on the scene pieced together how events unfolded. They drove their car down the hill together, and David was still alive at the time. They turned this way and then backed in here and had a conversation in this area for some time. At some point in the conversation, David must have realized that um, he was in some sort of trouble with, with Mr. Cunanan, and, and so he jumped out of the car and ran this direction. Andrew Cunanan shot him in the back. He fell face down onto the ground, at which time Andrew Cunanan turned him over and shot him. You think you know somebody? The person we thought we knew was uh, long gone. Less than a week after leaving his ex-lover dead in Rush City, Cunanan's rampage gathered pace and took him 450 miles southeast to Chicago and to the door of 72-year-old property millionaire Lee Miglin and his most vicious slaughter so far. Andrew Cunanan's killing spree had begun in Minneapolis, where he had bludgeoned to death his first victim, Jeffrey Trail. 60 miles north, and former lover David Madsen had lost his life on the banks of Rush Lake. Now, Cunanan's rampage would take an even darker turn. May the 3rd, Chicago, Illinois. Lee Miglin was a wealthy property developer well-respected and well-recognized in the city. No one is sure what drove Cunanan to his door, although some speculate that they had met years before in California. Whatever Cunanan's motivation, revenge, retribution, or simply robbery, at some point over that May weekend, Miglin succumbed to what his elderly mother described as a worse death than Christ. Cunanan overpowered Mr. Miglin, tied him up, put a sheet over him, and tortured him. This was a very cruel death. In fact, in some ways, much crueler than the death of his two friends earlier. The way that Cunanan killed Mr. Miglin is quite different from how spree killers often kill their victims. This was not an indiscriminate shooting. This took thought, and he took pleasure from this, and he engaged in overkill. He'd now crossed the Rubicon and was killing for the pleasure. Lee Miglin had become Andrew Cunanan's third victim. And now the FBI had entered the chase. Three dead bodies had earned Cunanan the label armed and extremely dangerous. He continued to evade capture, despite the trace on Miglin's car phone. Cunanan takes off in Miglin's Lexus. Um, police are able to establish the movement of the car through its um, phone, which Cunanan has started using. A countrywide APB had been issued for Cunanan's arrest. Radio News reported that the killer was traveling in Miglin's distinctive Lexus. Cunanan needed another vehicle at any cost. May the 8th, Pennsville, New Jersey, 765 miles from Chicago, a resting place for hundreds of Civil War soldiers and a hiding place for a spree killer on the run. Vince Point 
was so secluded, uh, miles and miles off of the main highway that drove through that, through that area. Fins Point Cemetery is normally very quiet and peaceful. Cemetery caretaker William Reese had worked at Fins Point for 15 years. Bill and I did a lot of stuff together. Uh, we hung out together, performed Civil War reenactments and long drives, long talks. Bill was a very uh, special person. He was kind, a uh, very dedicated person also. He, he, uh, he, he, would, he was very faithful. He would be here right at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he would spend a full day here. Bill was just a part of us. Bill was, was there for us, and we were there for Bill. We were more like siblings than, than we were, you know, uh, workers. Enormously funny and a laugh that was infectious beyond words. He was, uh, and his face lit up when he laughed. It was a cool, dark day that I remember, and, and it was, uh, it, you know, I, I had, a, a, when I left, I, I don't know why I had a feeling, but I had a feeling there was something wrong. I was sitting in the living room and my wife and kids were on the couch. It was near evening. Um, uh, Bill's brother, Bob, called. And I answered the phone, and Bob said, I don't know how to say this, but Bill was shot and killed. Um, and then just kind of went numb. Cemetery caretaker William Reese had become Cunanan's fourth victim. As William Reese is locking up for the day, Cunanan stops his car, jumps out, and asks William Reese if he could possibly let him have a glass of water because he's not feeling very well. William Reese invites Cunanan in. But within seconds, Cunanan's pulled out Jeffrey Trail's gun and shot William Reese dead with just one bullet. Where Bill was murdered was in the basement of the house. I haven't been into that building since this happened. Um, I don't think I could go back into that building after Bill was, was shot and killed there. Even 16 years doesn't change things. <sighs> Bill was not just a victim. He was not just a, um, a cemetery caretaker. He was loved, he loved the family, he loved people. Bill was a human being. <sighs> Huge void in the family. Andrew Cunanan had gone from killing friends to murdering strangers in cold blood. This time there was no torture. This time it was a quick death. It's like Cunanan was trying to use different modus operandi to perhaps challenge the agents who were chasing him. No one knew where Cunanan would strike next, what was driving him, and who would be his next victim. May the 12th, 1997. Andrew Cunanan had arrived in Miami, Florida. He was getting ready to shock a generation. Miami was the perfect place to harbor a chameleon like Cunanan. You know, every killer who commits multiple homicide has a comfort zone. Uh, most spree killers uh, don't travel. Uh, they stay within their own community because they know that place, they understand it better, and they're able to get away with murder. There are exceptions. 
Andrew Cunanan was no multiple personality, but he had a skill that very few people do have, and that is he could change his appearance to look like dozens of other people. Cunanan is America's most wanted man, yet he hides in plain sight. He makes no attempt to disguise himself. He makes no attempt to hide out in, in the latest car he's stolen. It's hard to say if Cunanan was asking to be caught, but I certainly think he was asking to have a showdown. He was asking to have his day of glory. He'd paid for a month's rent in advance, staying at the Normandy Plaza, a once swish hotel in the 50s. And he was living in plain sight around the beaches of Miami. He needed some funds, and he decided to go to a pawn shop where he would exchange one of the gold coins he took from Mr. Miglin's house for $200 cash. He was obliged to provide two pieces of ID. The only ID he had was his real name, and the real address where he was staying at the Normandy Plaza, which he gave. Yet again, Cunanan had taken a risk and got away with it. The pawn shop passed on the forms as required to the Miami police, where they lay on a desk unnoticed. There was really nobody looking for him here. Nobody thought he was here. He really was here out and about like a normal citizen, uh, minding his own business for, for at least two months that we know. Andrew Cunanan lived and loitered in Miami until the middle of July. Now he was ready to claim the most famous victim of his notorious spree. During Cunanan's heyday in San Diego, he was often heard boasting about his time spent with famous fashion designer Gianni Versace. Andrew had always talked about celebrities that he rubbed elbows with that he couldn't wait to tell us about his chance encounter and meeting fashion designer Gianni Versace. We laughed and we said, well, good for you, isn't that, isn't that something? Another tall tale, did he really meet him? Did they hang out in a limo and club it all night? Maybe yes, maybe no. It could be seen perhaps that Cunanan targeted Versace because it was an argument, it was an element of self-loathing against being homosexual and the gay community that he'd now turned against. There was also the belief that Cunanan thought he had HIV and he wanted to take it out on a, on a, on a symbolism for the homosexual culture. Versace would be an ideal target that would bring everything together in one tumultuous storm. At 8.55 a.m., Andrew Cunanan shot dead one of the world's most famous fashion designers at point-blank range. Cunanan was now the most wanted man in the world, and a massive police hunt had begun. The clues weren't hard to find. William Reese's truck had been left in a nearby car park. We discovered that the clothes that the witnesses had described was laying on the ground next to the truck. And he went out the fire exit and got into a taxi cab and fled before we were able to secure that garage. The impact of the Versace slaying continued to grow. It was a big deal that this was not just some, you know, random celebrity. This was, a, this was going to be international news. This was going to turn the city upside down. And it did. When I ran by that day, I looked over to the east here, and I just saw these new satellite dishes all over the place, maybe, uh, I'd say dozens of them. I managed, you know, to kind of run by and see the blood on the steps, because everybody talked about the blood on the steps, and it stayed there for a long time. Played out in the spotlight of rolling news, the global media soaked up the breaking story. We quickly shut down the city before Andrew Cunanan was able to leave, so we were fairly convinced that he was still in Miami Beach. 
It was a huge manhunt. Everything stopped in Miami. Everything was focused on this manhunt. And everybody descended upon South Beach. International news, and we uh, basically uh, stayed at the police station, you know, 24-7. It was just crazy. I mean, it, it was it became a media circus. I mean, the police were coming in, asking questions. Um, it, was, it was so much activity on Ocean Drive and the cameras and, and, the, and the people, and, and it was still the fear. The warmth of the Miami streets was replaced by cold dread and panic. Well, we didn't know what happened. We don't know why it happened, if it was random or the guy knew him. There was a lot of uncertainty. You know, people were worried about, is there a killer on the street? Um, you know, if he was shot, are they going to come shoot other people? It was, it, was, it was scary. We all had the news on. Then all of a sudden, I hear that he's killed other gay people in different cities. A lot of the gay people felt they were in danger from him, that he'll kill others. You know, people were just, like, on edge the whole time. By murdering one of the most famous people in the world, Cunanan was now going to be headline news in every sense of the world. As the world watched on, could Cunanan be caught before he killed again? In 1997, a vicious spree killer had been terrorizing America on a 2,000-mile, three-month bloody rampage. Andrew Cunanan had just claimed his fifth victim, gunning down the world-famous fashion designer Gianni Versace on the steps of his South Beach mansion in broad daylight. You couldn't pick somebody more important to a person like Andrew, and yet, at his own hand, he saw his demise. But eight days after the murder, the trail had gone cold. Putting his face out there was a difficult task. I remember we came up with a photo lineup of about six different Andrew Cunanan, and we put it out on a poster for the media to help assist us with locating him, and that's how the leads came in. It was just a, a massive manhunt, and it was almost unfathomable that he could not find this guy. Yet, he was such a chameleon and blended in so well that there was more than one or two times that I thought I saw him. Uh, was it him? I don't know. The day I saw Cunan and the beach was really kind of empty, nobody around, and this one guy was sitting on the rail. And he was just sitting there staring at me for a good 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It was kind of eerie in a way. So I opened my window and I said, you have a freaking problem? <laughs> and he just looked at me and then he walked away. And uh, when I went home that night, I uh, looked on Channel 7 News, and I looked and I saw, and that's when I knew it was him. His head was shaved, so he didn't look like the picture in the paper. So that's why I didn't recognize him. Wednesday, the 23rd of July, 1997, Ocean Drive, Miami. Time was running out for Cunanan. Caretaker Fernando Carrera had stopped by to check on a vacant Indian Creek houseboat moored two and a half miles from Versace's mansion on Ocean Drive. He had stumbled across an unwelcome house guest. This was where Andrew Cunanan had sought refuge. I don't think that there was any attempt from Cunanan to move out of Florida. He stayed hiding in a, in, a, in a broken houseboat that he'd found whilst the owner was away. He was almost making his last stand. But I don't think he had much faith that the police would catch up with him because he had a very low opinion of law enforcement. They were clearly inferior to him and they'd not done a very good job of catching up with him so far. As Carrera ran to alert the authorities, a shot rang out. When that call came in, it was a shots fired call. Everybody just knew this had to be it. The authorities respond incredibly quickly this time. 
and are swarming all around the houseboat within minutes of being alerted to it by the caretaker. I was there on the island when they finally cornered him at the, at the houseboat. And when I got there, there was, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people there, hundreds and hundreds of reporters, police, all around this houseboat. After a, a standoff of a couple of hours, during which there's no reaction from Kuhn Annan, they decide to lob uh, tear gas into the, into the vessel. was live media coverage, you know, 24-7 almost. Everyone was glued to the news. It was crazy to watch. We were watching that on TV, kind of, you know, sitting in, in the uh, conference room watching that on TV as it unfolded, because uh, we didn't know how it was going to end at that time. The nightmare ended, caught on a 1,000 cameras in the full glare of the media spotlight. Myself and an FBI agent were the first ones inside. He hadn't shot at the caretaker. He had killed himself. Cunanan's death, he shot himself before the police could get to him. And he shot himself wearing a pair of shorts in a double bed with a single gunshot to the right side of his head. He was in control over how he would go. Nobody else was going to take his life or take his liberty. And he chose a very Hollywood, glamorous, almost homoerotic way to die. The reign of terror brought upon us by Andrew Cunanan is over. I'm exhausted. I'm, the adrenaline has been pumping for hours, and uh, I'm realizing that this story that we've basically been living with is, is over. I think he was on a suicidal rampage to begin with. I think Cunanan had intended from the beginning to kill himself. But first, he was going to get even with all those wealthy men and those concepts of wealthy men, like Versace. The kind of things Andrew wished for, the kind of places that he put himself, the kind of stories he told us, they were stories of somebody else's life, somebody that I guess we'll never know. Cunanan's death brought with it a mix of emotions for those who had been affected by his brutal spree. We were not unhappy that Cunanan committed suicide and that we did not have to go to trial and, and listen to the lies and, and the other kinds of things. Andrew Cunanan was a man that caused misery for many people. Everybody was pretty uh, relieved that he wasn't on the loose anymore. Well, I'm thankful that the taxpayers are not keeping him alive in prison. Andrew Cunanan had journeyed from being his father's precocious protege to the class clown with a fabricated family background, to the enigmatic life and soul of every party he attended, and finally, to one of the most brutal spree killers in American history. Andrew Cunanan had to be the center of attention. In his school yearbook, next to his picture, he prophetically wrote, Après moi le déluge, simply put, after me, the storm. Yet the question remained, why did Andrew Cunanan have murder in mind? And what drove him to his killing spree? Andrew was over the top in every way. He was over the top in his affect, his personality, and he was over the top when it came to killing. Well, Andrew Cunanan was a, a, a unique spree killer. He had created a false identity. He had created a false image in his mind and when that shattered he shattered and he kind of left pieces of himself as he went from murder to murder to murder he couldn't handle the fact that he'd once been the glamorous doyen of the gay party circuit and now he was alone putting on weight slowly losing his hair and possibly had a hiv he was clearly very angry but he wasn't to blame and other people were going to pay the price by killing a well-known celebrity like Versace and then committing suicide, uh, Cunanan was assured of having his place in infamy, and that's exactly what he wanted. 